Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Father Robert Imbelli. I'm in the theology department and also on the steering committee of the Church in the 21st Century Initiative. Uh, I would like to introduce the person who will introduce Father Himes. Uh, as you know, the Church in the 21st Century Initiative was begun two years ago as an initiative, and as you know, it has sponsored numerous activities, one of which is this series, the Adventure of Faith series. But as you may have read in the Heights or other newspapers, that this initiative is now going to be established as a permanent center here at Boston College. And the assistant director who was just appointed uh, to that position of the Church in the 21st Century Cent uh, Center is Dawn Overstreet. And so it's my pleasure to present Dawn who will introduce Father Himes this evening. Thirteen years ago, while I was a undergraduate at a small Catholic liberal arts college in Indiana, <laughs> whom your uh, BC is planning to beat this uh, coming Saturday, uh, I took Father Heim's belief in modernity class on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4.30 in Higgins Hall. And the reason I remember that is because after every class, my best friend Elizabeth and I would walk across to North Dining Hall and spend the next two hours over dinner talking about what it is that we had discussed in class. I was a business major at Notre Dame, and this was the first advanced theology class I had ever taken. And I remember asking two questions the entire semester, both of which elicited laughter from the 100 plus students <laughs> in the classroom. One was, I asked Father Himes if he would spell the names of all the people that he was referring to on the chalkboard, because I didn't know how the heck you spell Tertullian, Heidegger, or Schleiermacher. <laughs> I still don't. Um, and secondly, I wanted to know if the final exam would be comprehensive. Somehow, uh, wondering whether faith and theology could not be comprehensive seems uh, to elude me. But at the time, it seemed like a perfectly valid question. Uh, Father Himes left Notre Dame when I graduated um, in uh, May of 1993. I like to think that it's because he couldn't bear to uh, be at a university without students like the likes of me. But he came to the Heights right after that, and a year later I followed him out here when I came to graduate school at Boston College. And at some point in life, you take stock in the people who have significantly impacted your life direction or path. And I can say with certainty that um, Father Himes is on my short list, probably the top three. Um, my parents a close second. In how I find myself standing here today working with Church in the 21st Century. And three things are certain that I can say about Father Himes. One is he'll always talk about St. Augustine, he'll always talk about agape, and he'll always be a living witness to the transformative power of the love of Christ and how to integrate your faith both intellectually and personally on a daily basis. So to my friend, my model, and my uh, professor, Father Michael Himes. Well, I'm embarrassed to say anything after that introduction. Yes, as a matter of fact, it was precisely because you were graduating, Dawn, that I said, well, why stay here? What's the point now that, now that Dawn is leaving? Um, it's a great honor to be with you again this evening. This is the next to last lecture in this series, The Adventure of Faith. Uh, I've been greatly honored to have given three of them counting this evening. Uh, the very first one, which was on the creed uh, being Trinitarian in shape, that the Trinity is the shape of the whole of the creed. Last year on the incarnation, on the word being made flesh, and now this year on church. The last lecture coming up will be from the other Himes. Uh, my brother Kenneth will give a lecture in a, another two weeks or three weeks uh, on uh, 
the concluding articles of the creed, the, the summary statements of our hope as Christian believers, the resurrection of the body and life eternal. Um, but what I want to talk about this evening is a particular slant on the church. And let me explain why. Some years ago, I was reviewing a book for a journal in this country, a very distinguished theology journal, uh, Theological Studies. And the book was a hefty German tome. There are no such things as light German books. A hefty German tome on the church that was originally designed as a kind of textbook on church, on ecclesiology, the study of the church. And um, it, so it was a very good book. It was written with German thoroughness. It was just a wash in footnotes. It covered all sorts of topics in great depth. But I kept feeling, as I was reading it with my review in mind, that there was something missing. There was something that I that just I felt wasn't being touched in the book. And it finally came, I finally came to realize what it was when I asked myself the question in the course of writing the review, well, if this is a textbook, if it was designed originally as a textbook, could I as a teacher ever imagine using it in a class? And my immediate response was no. And uh, I had to ask, okay, why not? And it finally dawned on me it was because it seemed to me, with all of the many things that it discussed about the church, the text never asked, and therefore never obviously addressed, what I think is the single most important, most pressing question for Catholics today, certainly for Catholics in the United States, but I suspect Catholics in much of the first world and perhaps beyond the first world. And that question is, why do you bother to have a church? Forget how it was founded and how it's structured and what its offices are and what its mission is. Why bother to have a church at all? Now, you see, that's a very pressing question, I think, in the, in the United States especially, because the characteristic American way of asking the question is, why do I need a church? And what's important to notice is the pronoun I. It's singular. Why do I, as an individual, what do I, as this particular individual person, what do I get out of the church? What do I need it for? I mean, maybe it's all well and good for folks who like that sort of thing. You know, if there are people who just love to get together on Sunday mornings and sing hymns, well, that's fine. But if that's not your particular favorite thing to do on Sunday mornings, mine is the New York Times crossword puzzle and eggs benedict. Um, if, if singing hymns together is not your favorite thing on a Sunday morning, what do you need it for? Why bother? It's closely connected to something that is a very important phenomenon in our country at the present time. And it is this. Survey after survey, study after study, done by very distinguished, distinguished social, uh, sociologists, have noted that Americans, all Americans, not only American Catholics, all Americans across the board will say that they are immensely interested in, terrifically concerned about spirituality. That spirituality is a very big issue that people will describe themselves as being spiritually concerned people. They're concerned about their spiritual life and fostering their spiritual life. And yet, more and more people in those same surveys will say that they're not necessarily attached to any particular religious community. They don't identify with any particular church organization or church tradition that they don't see a connection between being spiritual and being part of a church. That at most, the church becomes a kind of um, support group for people who like that sort of thing. But it's not necessary 
to one's spiritual life. What do I eat at church for? Is it spirituality enough? Indeed, I've sometimes suggested that uh, in my experience, if you want to fill a room in, when you're giving a lecture on a campus, include the word spirituality in the title. Early Ming vase painting and spirituality. And people will show up. If you want to empty the room, put the word church in. Uh, erotic lessons of the Kama Sutra and the church, and nobody will show. <laughs> Why the church? That's my topic for this evening. Why is the church essential if indeed we are going to be spiritually alive human beings? Why is it that the Catholic tradition sees church as so central? And I'm going to suggest two reasons. Now, they're very deeply rooted reasons, but I won't point out how deep the roots are until concluding. Instead, I'll go right to the reasons. And the first reason is this. It has to do, perhaps I can best illustrate it, by asking you to think about what, at first glance, will appear one of the least inspiring least exciting verses of the Gospel of Luke. It is chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 of Luke's Gospel. Now, you may remember the first two chapters of Luke's Gospel have to do with Jesus' birth and childhood. So we hear about the Annunciation, the Visitation. We hear of Jesus' birth. We hear, and the final story is, the end of chapter 2, is Jesus being lost and then found by his parents when he's about 12 in the temple at Jerusalem. Chapter 3 begins where Mark's gospel begins. It begins with the ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism by John in the Jordan. And the way in which Luke introduces the story is, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of uh, Iturea and Trachonitis, when Lysanias was governor of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came in the desert beyond the Jordan to John, the son of Zechariah. As I said, you probably haven't used that for meditation recently. <laughs> it doesn't seem like a terribly insightful or exciting verse. I suggest to you it's all important. And it's all important because it is the antithesis of once upon a time. The claim that's being made so importantly, so insistently by Luke at the beginning of chapter 3 is that what I am about to tell you is not a timeless tale. It's not a great myth that can be reenacted over and over again in the course of human experience. It is a very particular claim about very particular events that happen to particular people in a particular time and a particular place. To people like John, the son of Zechariah, in a place like the, the, the desert just beyond the Jordan, in the 15th year of the reign of the emperor Tiberius. It is important because what it maintains is exactly that the gospel is exactly what the word gospel, of course, originally meant. Good news, good proclamation, evangelium. And good news requires a good reporter. The all-important fact about a historical event is that there's no way that anybody can deduce it. Some years ago, I wrote a book of inordinate length and preternatural dullness uh, about a 19th century theologian who particularly interests me, and as it happens, no one else in the world, um, a great Catholic theologian named Johann Adam Merler. And Merler, in one of his books, makes the observation, if no one told you that Scipio Africanus had conquered Carthage in the Second Punic War, there is no way that you would ever be able to figure it out. You might 
discover the ruins of Carthage, you would know there had been such a place, and that it wasn't there any longer, and that something had destroyed it. But that it was the Romans under Scipio Africanus in a, this particular year, at the end of the Second Punic War, there's no way you could figure that out. Someone has to report it to someone who tells someone, who writes it down, and someone else reads it, who teaches it to you. The historical events are only transmissible because there are witnesses and reporters to that event. Now, I'm not simply talking about what the letter to the Hebrews refers to as a cloud of witnesses, because a cloud of witnesses, by very definition of the word cloud, is somewhat amorphous and vague. The witnesses in my life, the reporters, are, have been very concrete. They're my mother and my father, my teachers, my family, my friends, the people sur surrounded my family, my pastors. Those are the people who have, in the course of my life, been the reporters, the people who brought the news, who reported the good news to me. Without them, I would have no connection I would have no way of knowing what happened in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius in the desert on the other side of the Jordan to John, the son of Zechariah, or to anybody else for that matter. That in order to know that, I have to be linked into an ongoing collection of witnesses. Those witnesses necessarily form a community. One tells the other, who tells the other, who tells the other, spread back in time for 20 centuries now. And they form an institution. Now, the fact is, most of us, at least in the United States today, tend to be gun-shy about institutions. We tend to be su su suspicious of institutions, and rightly so. We've seen an awful lot of institutions fail us. We see the institution of the Roman Catholic Church fail at the United States in immensely significant ways in recent years. So we tend to be very suspicious of institutions. By all means, suspect them, but never think you can do without them. Institutions are necessary. They come with being in space and time. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean, a very simple and obvious one. Let us say that the group of us decide, you know, it would be a good thing to pray together. Yet I'm all for that. I think praying together is a very good thing. I doubt anybody here is going to stand up and say, nope, I'm opposed to prayer. We are, so let's all get together and pray. Now, when will we do it? Well, how about Thursday at 3 o'clock? No, Dawn Overstreet can't make it Thursday at 3 o'clock. Uh, well, how about Friday at 11? No, Bob Newton can't make it Friday at 11. Well, how about next Monday at noon? Is that good with everything? Monday at noon? Wonderful. We'll meet here next Monday at noon, and then someone discovers, no, this room is booked at Monday noon next week. All right, well, we can't meet here. Uh, we'll meet over in O'Neill Library. No, O'Neill Library is at use. We can't use O'Neill Library. Well, we'll meet in St. Mary's Chapel at 12 noon on Monday. Is that good with everyone? Everyone can make it, and that place is great? Wonderful. What we just did was create an institution. The only way to avoid an institution would be to say, let us wander around the universe, and if we ever all bump into one another at the same time, at the same place, by heaven, we'll certainly pray. There is no way to live in time and space apart from the forming of institutions. They can be very elaborate institutions, they can be very simple institutions, but they are necessarily institutions. That community of witnesses is institutionalized over the course of its history. That institution that carries the good news, that proclaims it and has proclaimed it for 2,000 years, that is in very large part what we mean by a church. So the first reason why a church is, without it, you would never be able to know anything about the Incarnation. You might hope for it, you might dream of it, you might long for it, you might dread it, but you could never know about it. The fact is that the only connection we have with the Word made flesh is going to be mediated to us 
through witnesses and reporters, because it's not a typeless event, it's not an ageless myth, it's a claim about particular historical events at a particular time, a particular place, happening to particular people. You can deduce the Pythagorean theorem if you're really bright and have enough time. You don't necessarily need a teacher. You can figure it out. But there is no way that you can figure out what happened at Gettysburg in 1863 unless somebody told somebody who told somebody who told you. So the first reason why the church is because it is our link with the historical event of the incarnation. It is our link with God's entry into our world at a particular moment, at a particular place. The second reason why the church is best illustrated by two stories. Now, I have written about these two stories elsewhere, and I have told these stories many times that some of you have perhaps heard me tell them, and if so, I apologize, because you're going to get it inflicted on you again. Uh, I have no mercy. Um, but they, the, they are stories that make the point so well that I cannot resist using them. The stories come, perhaps two of the most fascinatingly paired stories from the 19th century. One comes from Friedrich Nietzsche, and the other comes from Fyodor Dostoevsky. The Nietzsche story comes from the third book of his The Gay Science. It's the passage that Nietzsche refers to as the madman. If you know it, it's perhaps the most famous single passage in all of Nietzsche because it contains the one sentence that everybody immediately associates with Nietzsche's name. The story as Nietzsche tells it is this. One day, into the marketplace, very important to notice it's a marketplace, into the marketplace came a madman who was carrying a lantern and the madman said that he was looking for God, and he kept inquiring whether anyone had seen God. And the people at the marketplace, who, Nietzsche says, did not believe in God. So it's very important to notice they're already non-believers before the madman ever gets there. The people at the marketplace who did not believe in God begin to laugh at the madman, to make fun of him. Is God lost? Has he wandered away and can't find his way back? Somebody misplaced God. That's why you have to look for him. And Nietzsche says the madman fixed them with his gaze and said, is it possible that you do not know the great and terrible news? Is it possible that you have not heard the single most important event that has ever happened? God is dead, and you and I have killed God. Haven't you noticed that every day it gets darker and colder? It is as if the earth has come unhooked from the sun and is now spitting off into the endless empty void of space. There isn't any up or down, any right or left, any backwards or forwards anymore. Because God is dead and you and I have killed him. And the people at the marketplace, who remember, never believed in God. The people at the marketplace stare at the madman in astonishment. And the madman turns to go, throws down the lantern and smashes it. And as he leaves the marketplace, murmurs to himself, I have come too early. They are not yet ready to face the consequences of their great and terrible deed. I think that story is almost unimaginably chilling in its insightfulness. Please notice it takes place in a marketplace. Presumably that 19th century laissez-faire capitalist marketplace that Nietzsche loathed so profoundly. A marketplace which is governed by one great principle, the principle of laissez-faire capitalism, competition. If I win, you lose. If you win, I lose. We are in competition with one another. 
There's a zero-sum game. If I get up 90%, you only have 10. If I can take your 10%, then I have all of the pie. And in that world, governed simply by competition, in that world, Nietzsche insists, God is already dead. If what lives one's life with competition as the overarching rubric, I win, you lose. Always look out for double one. Aim at being top dog. Devil take the hindmost. If that's the world in which you live, then in that world, God is dead. Dead as a doornail. The God that we're talking about of the Christian tradition is simply eliminated from such a world. That's why the people in the marketplace don't believe in God. They may not yet be willing to confront the fact that they've killed God in their world. But God is already dead in that world, Nietzsche insists. Although they are not yet ready to confront the great and terrible deed. It's a world in which the need to attend to other human beings is at best an interesting hobby that you may enjoy. Do you like loving your neighbor? Isn't that nice? I collect stamps myself. <laughs> but if you like, if you like loving your neighbor, she likes golf, he likes fly fishing. Everybody has their own likes and dislikes. If you like caring for your neighbor, that's perfectly fine. But there's no necessity that you love your neighbor. Don't tell me that I ought to love my neighbor any more than I can tell you that you ought to collect stamps or go fly fishing. It's simply a matter of taste. And we all know there's no accounting for tastes. So if you like loving your neighbor, if that gives you a kick, if you enjoy it, all well and good. But there's no obligation, there's no reason there's no ground for loving your neighbor. It's simply your prejudice. And that's all well and good. And if you say to yourself, that's a very grim world. That's a very dark world. Yes, says Nietzsche. Getting darker and colder every day. Haven't you noticed? There is no up or down or back or forth or right or left any longer. Nietzsche was convinced, if people realized that that was the world that they were creating, then they would discover that they couldn't survive in it. Which is why Nietzsche, of course, announces in Thus Spake Zarathustra, I proclaim to you the Superman. Because the merely human, human all too human, as Nietzsche entitles one of his books, the merely human can't survive in a world that dark or cold. It requires the superhuman to look the universe straight in the eye and discover that there's nothing there to look back. That it is simply empty and cold and impersonal. Let me take a contrasting story. I certainly am not going to leave you there for the evening. Well, it was lovely talking to you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Go home, despair, and die. Uh, <laughs> let me take a story from Dostoevsky's great novel, The Brothers Karamazov. If you've read The Brothers Karamazov, if you haven't read The Brothers Karamazov, what in heaven's name are you wasting your time here this evening for? You should be home reading The Brothers Karamazov. You're not going to do anything more useful than that. If you've read The Brothers Karamazov, you may remember that the youngest of the three legitimate Karamazov brothers, uh, Alexei, um, is uh, a, a novice in a monastery at the beginning of the novel, a Russian Orthodox monastery in a town somewhere in the middle of Russia at the beginning of the ninth, early on in the 19th century. And his spiritual director, is a great monk who is renowned throughout Russia as a spiritual director, sort of a 19th century Russian Orthodox Thomas Merton, 
something, someone who everyone knows, Father Zosima. And Father Zosima will die early on in the book. He dies all oh, a quarter of the way into the, that great novel. But before he does, Dostoevsky wants to make certain that he's lodged our memory of that character very deeply within us, because in many ways, Father Zosipa's words will hang over the whole rest of the novel, even though he's passed off the scene early on. So he gives us a series of conversations in which people come to consult Father Zosipa about various questions and problems that they're having. And the last of these gets a chapter entirely to itself. It's the shortest chapter in the book. It's entitled something like, depending on the translation one is reading, The Woman Who Had Lost Faith, or The Woman Who Had Little Faith. A woman comes to see Father Zosibo, who's very well-dressed, seems to be financially very comfortable. And it turns out she's in good health. There are no pressing problems that anyone would notice externally in her life. But when she comes to Father Zosipa, she's obviously distraught. She says to him, I have gone everywhere. I've spoken to everyone. I've tried everything. I can find no solution to my problem, and I cannot live with what's happened to me. If you cannot help me, I will have to kill myself. This is known as putting a little pressure on your counselor. Um, Father Zosipa says to her, I will be, of course, delighted to assist you, if I can. What, what is the problem? And the woman goes on to tell him that she had grown up in a good, devout Russian Orthodox family. She'd grown up going to church, reading the scriptures, praying regularly. But somewhere along the line in her life, she doesn't know when, was it some great crisis of faith, some terrible event that happened to her or someone close to her, but somewhere along the line, without her even noticing it, she had stopped believing in God. She says she doesn't know when it happened or where it happened, but bit by bit, a phrase that keeps appearing at the conversation, bit by bit, she discovered she didn't believe in God. And when she discovered it, she says, the whole of my life went gray. Nothing seemed to be important any longer. There didn't seem to be any ultimate value in anything. There were things that were pleasant and good, and, but they, 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 none of them had any lasting value. Everything in life seemed up for grabs. It all tasted like ashes. She says, quoting the Russian poet Pushkin, Everybody in Dostoevsky quotes Pushkin at the drop of a hat. Um, she says, quoting Pushkin, it, it was as if there is nothing in life that is real except the weeds that grow on my grave. And I cannot live like this. If you can't help me, I must kill myself. And Father Zosipa says to her, what you are experiencing is the single most terrible thing that can ever happen to a human being the utter, total loss of meaning and purpose in existence. And I think I can help you. What you must do is go home again, and every day, every day without fail, as concretely and practically as possible, you must set out to love the people around you. If you do that every day without fail, and not just as some general benevolent good wishing, good wishes for people, but practically, concretely loving the people around you. If you do that every day, bit by bit, echoing her phrase, you will come to discover that you cannot not believe in God. And he concludes, this way has been tried. This way is certain. Dorothy Day, of Catholic worker fame, loved that story, but she always insisted you had to go on to the very next lines. And I think she's absolutely correct. Because the woman then says to Father Sosima, that's it? 
That's all there is? I've come all this way, and you tell me the whole solution to my immense problem is go home and love the people around me? And Father Zosipa says, ah, if that's how you respond, you haven't really understood me. I am talking about a great and terrible love. It may very well destroy you. To concretely set out to love the people around us every day is a great and terrible undertaking. Do it, and it may very well destroy you. But it is also, as Dostoevsky points out through Father Zosima, it is the certain way in which to discover belief in the existence of God. I would suggest to you the entire rest of the novel, the whole of the rest of that magnificent novel of Dostoevsky's, is an enormous series of arguments between the other characters in the book about whether or not Zosima's claim is justified. Is that right? If you do that every day, will you inevitably, bit by bit, discover that you, that you believe in God? Is it certain? My personal conviction is, with immense respect and admiration for St. Anselm of Canterbury and St. Thomas Aquinas, for Descartes and Kant and Hegel and all those other learned folk who have offered proofs for the existence of God, that's the only one that really works. And I say that because all of the others will lead you or may lead you to a concept of God. They lead you to an idea of God. Whereas Father Zosima's way leads you to an experience of God. And that's a very much deeper and richer thing. It's the difference between by saying to you, do you know John Smith here at the university? Well, here, here's a dossier on John Smith. It's got all the information you could ever want to know about John Smith. There is a qualitative difference between reading the dossier and by saying to you, here's John Smith, shake hands with him. One is an experience, the other is a description. However elaborate, however rich, however comprehensive, it leads you to an idea or a concept, and that's very much less than a concrete experience, which is what Father Zosiba's way is designed to do. That's why it has been tried this way is certain. I would suggest to you that those two stories are mirror images of one another. Both Nietzsche and Dostoevsky have realized exactly the same thing. Nietzsche, however, realizes it negatively, and Dostoevsky realizes it positively. What they've realized is that the way in which one speaks about the existence of God is a product, it's a result, of your experience of loving other human beings. If you live in a world in which genuine love for other human beings is ruled out, is impossible, if it's all competition, if there is no actual self-giving to one another, in that world, God is as dead as a doornail. On the other hand, if you live a life which, in which you attempt to concretely and practically, every day without fail, love the people around you, However grindingly dull, however brutally difficult that may be at times, and it is, if you do that, you will discover that of course you believe in God. It is impossible not to believe in God because you will experience the very ground of your ability to love as something given to you, not produced by you. Those two stories lead me to my second reason, why the church. Why do you need the church? Because in the Christian tradition, you cannot possibly believe in God, speak about God meaningfully, or speak to God meaningfully in prayer, apart from a context of genuine love of one's neighbor. If you attempt to do it, you will end up believing in a very nice idol. 
It may be a lovely idol. It may be a comforting idol. Maybe an idol that you can dress up with scriptural images. You may be able to deck it out in the phrases of the catechism. You may be able to parade it around in liturgical ceremonies and wave incense at it. But it will be an idol nonetheless. And what you say about it will be lovely and poetic and ultimately frivolous. And what you say to it will be nonsense syllables instead of prayer. That within the context of the Christian tradition, you can't know what God means aside from a context of mutual, of, of agapic love. This is what the first letter of John insists when it says that God is love, that God is least wrongly understood as pure and perfect agape. Dawn said I'd get it in. St. Augustine will come. Um, that it is always a it is always agape which allows us to understand what we mean by God. And if you live in a context in which agape is ruled out, then the word God will be not syllables. Probably the bluntest statement of that ever written is in the first letter of John, chapter 4. The statement that anyone who claims to love God whom he cannot see, but does not love the neighbor whom he can see, is it's usually translated as is lying. But in fact, the actual Greek verb means, can be lying, but it can also be that I have a suspicion this translates it better. It can mean something like is babbling, is talking nonsense, is raving, doesn't know what he's talking about that if you claim to love God, but you don't love your neighbor, not only don't you know who your neighbor is, you don't know who your God is. That whatever you be by the word God will turn out to be idolatrous. That, and the church is a community called to be agapic. It may, forget may, it has, it will, it will go on failing horribly at that on all levels in the church. But it will always know that it is called to live agopically. It will always know it is judged by whether or not it lives agopically. And it will always be in need of repentance for not living agopically. It will always be a community in which agape is presented, self gift the giving of the self for the good of the other is presented as absolutely crucial. And apart from living in that kind of community, the word God will be meaningless. It will be a little bit like if I were to say to you, when we say that the least wrong way to understand the word God is agape, if, you don't, if God is mystery and you don't know agape, then there's no... We've told you nothing about God. If I say to you, do you know John Smith, and you say no, and I say he's exactly like Bill Brown, and you say I don't know him either, then the comparison isn't very helpful. If I say to you, yes, the ultimate mystery, God, you know the least wrong way to think of it is agape, and you say I've never seen it, don't know what it is, haven't bumped into it, never experienced it, never saw anybody else do it, then in that world, the word God means nothing. Nietzsche's right. In that world, God is effectively dead. Therefore, why church? Because we need a community that even when it fails at agape, knows that it's failed. Occasionally, especially in recent years, some friends have, some family members, have said to me, why do you go on being Catholic? What keeps you in the church? And the answer is a thousand things keep me in the church. But one thing that certainly keeps me in the church is this. That when I look at the Roman Catholic Church and I find it wanting in dozens and dozens of ways, where did I learn the standard by which I am judging the church and finding it wanting? I learned it from the church. And any community that has faithfully proclaimed and taught for 2,000 years the standard by which it itself is condemned 
is a community well worth belonging to. A community that is faithful to the proclamation of a standard which it knows it's failing, but which it goes on proclaiming, is a very important community to foster. It is a, it is a community that fosters us. So, why the church? Two reasons. Because it is the community of witnesses who go on proclaiming the events that we would never have been connected to without it, and it is a community of agapic love, or at least of, of agapic vocation, without which we would not be able to talk about God meaningfully at all. Now, do you remember that I said at the beginning of the evening that I was going to give two very deep reasons indeed for why the church, but that I wouldn't point out how deep they were until the end. Well, the two reasons I just gave you are the incarnation and the doctrine of the Trinity. That apart from, apart from the church, I would not know of the incarnation. And apart from the church, I would not have experienced the agapic community the ultimate expression of which, the ultimate embodiment of which, the ultimate reality of which, is the community of the love of the beloved and the love between them, which is what St. Augustine thought was the best description for the doctrine of the Trinity. So why the church? Quite simply because of the word made flesh and the fact that God is love. Those are the two foundations for the church in our experience. There are a thousand reasons to feel disappointed in the church, but there are two great reasons to love it. The first reason is because it continues to tell us of the events of the word, the event of the word made flesh, which we would never know otherwise, and it continues to try, however failingly, to embody the agape, which is the primary experience of God. Put those two things together, and you've got a very good reason to belong to the church. It is the reason why to claim a spirituality without it is to have a spirituality which is nothing but a kind of emotional indulgence. The great danger of spirituality without the church is that we turn what should be a call to service into a self-help program. We turn it into something that makes us feel better. We turn the whole of Christianity into therapy. Therapy is a great good, but there's a lot more to the Christian tradition than therapy. There's a lot more to the Christian tradition than making me feel warm and fuzzy and good. There's a lot more to Christianity than my feeling comforted and encouraged. The ultimate reason that we embrace Christianity is because it happens to be true. And it is that claim that is grounded in the day-to-day, -day, constant, difficult, discouraging, challenging, stretching experience of trying to love our neighbors in light of the events proclaimed 2,000 years ago. So, why the church? Because of the word made flesh and God is love. Two best reasons I know. Thank you very much.